I'd like to talk some about uh, St. Augustine. Augustine uh, lived in the uh, 4th to 5th century AD. Uh, he was a convert to Christian faith. I say convert. Uh, he grew up in a home where his mother was a, a Catholic Christian and uh, his father uh, was a pagan up until later in life uh, where he converted also to Christianity. Um, but um, Augustine, his life experience is one in which he did not embrace the faith that he grew up with. Uh, his mother postponed his baptism. Uh, that was a very common practice uh, to postpone it until a, uh, a young person had sort of gotten beyond the, the wild years of youth. Uh, uh, many believe that uh, after one is baptized, uh, you are held to a very, very high standard. And so if you committed any very serious sins after baptism, uh, then you could not be assured of, of forgiveness of those sins. And so Augustine's mother, uh, uh, you know, kept him from baptism early in life. And so as a young man, he grew up in a little town in northern Africa uh, that um, wasn't known for having great centers of learning uh, or well-educated people. But Augustine, very early in life, showed himself to be a very, very bright and brilliant young man. Uh, he knew that. He, was, he knew of his brightness and his brilliance. And uh, often, as it does in young people uh, who are aware of their genius and of their great intellectual powers and their ability to run circles around the people uh, that they're surrounded with intellectually, uh, as it often does with young people, uh, Augustine became full of himself. He became full of, of, of pride and arrogance and self-centeredness. In fact, if you read through his famous, uh, perhaps his most famous work, uh, The Confessions, which is his autobiographical prayer uh, offered to God, reflecting on his life as a mature man now, looking back on his experience, uh, that's one of the words that keeps reappearing over and over again, or variations of the word pride or arrogance or self-centeredness. Uh, Augustine describes, uh, for, for example, in one particular scene, he describes his first encounter with Scripture. And uh, because of his uh, great eloquence and his study of the great Latin writers, especially Cicero, uh, when he turned to the Bible, it was very clumsy in comparison to these great Latin writers. And so Augustine uh, tells us that he turned away from it in disgust. Uh, but he said that later on, of course, he would return to the Bible and he would discover profound insights there. But he says he was not the kind of man that could enter into the sublime mysteries of Scripture. Uh, he said, because in order to enter into the Scriptures, you have to bow one's head. He said the gate of Scripture, the gate meaning by that the way it moves along, the way it walks along, the gate of Scripture is humble, but the heights it reaches are sublime. Uh, but he says, I was not the kind of man that could enter into it uh, because of his pride and because of his arrogance. So Augustine, full of himself, begins to look uh, in various places to try to find truth and wisdom. Uh, he goes, uh, his parents save up money to send him to the city of Carthage in Africa where they have a, a school where he can learn rhetoric. They're hoping that he'll become perhaps a politician, uh, perhaps a teacher of rhetoric, which is uh, very desirable in those days. Uh, people who speak well, communicate well, and can teach others to do so. And they can persuade other people of their ideas and, and beliefs. So Augustine goes to Carthage to study uh, rhetoric, and uh, while he's there, uh, he comes under the influence of the writings of Cicero, but one of the books by Cicero that he comes into contact with is a book called the Hortensius. And in the Hortensius, unfortunately this work has not survived through the centuries, but in this work uh, Cicero charges his students, his listeners, uh, to seek after wisdom above everything else, to find wisdom. Uh, and so uh, Augustine starts looking for wisdom, and he returns to the Bible, and that's when he is disappointed with what he finds there. Uh, it doesn't seem to be the source of wisdom for him. So he begins looking elsewhere, and he falls in, he tells us, with a group of uh, what he calls sensualists, that is, people who were totally preoccupied with the senses and what uh, knowledge or information they can give to us. And so Augustine uh, uh, falls in with this group. We know them as the Manichaeans. Uh, the Manichaeans, a uh, very uh, complicated religious movement in some ways, uh, but Augustine becomes a follower of Manichaean ideas for some time. Uh, and he will eventually work his way out of that intellectually after he becomes dissatisfied with many of the ideas of the Manichaeans. But there are three things in particular that I want to highlight with Augustine, and I think these highlight some of the important features of Augustine's own thought uh, that I'd like to, to use as a, a way of getting into him. And I'll look at one of them in this uh, presentation, and then I'll look at uh, the other two ideas in the other presentations. The, the first idea that uh, Augustine wrestled with and struggled with 
was the Manichaean argument against spirit, against there being any kind of spiritual reality. Uh, the second issue that I'd like to look at is uh, uh, the issue of evil, or the problem of evil, and I'll talk more about that in the next presentation. And then Augustine deals with the problem of faith. The Manichaeans claimed uh, that their religion was based solely upon reason, and that they could prove all of their ideas through the use of reason, and that the idea of Christian faith, accepting something on the authority of another, uh, is a cop-out for you really thinking and using your mind. So let's look very quickly at the first of these ideas, the one about spirit. The problem here is this. The Manichaeans uh, made this argument that you cannot consistently think about a spiritual reality. Say, for example, the, the very notion of spirit. Uh, think about what comes to your mind. What do you see in your mind uh, when you hear the word spirit? For most people, they see something like maybe a bright light, maybe a, a sort of see-through human form. Uh, maybe they see some ghost-looking character that you might see in a movie or cartoon or whatever. But you see some type of mental picture or some type of image that you associate with the idea of spirit. But none of those pictures that you have in your mind are really the reality. None of your, you know, like when you see a transparent human form, that's not really what we mean by spirit. Uh, if you see a bright light or a fire or whatever the various things that people see when you use the word spirit, none of those are really a spirit. Uh, they're, they're physical images that we have in our mind that in some way uh, express what we mean by spirit, but none of them really capture it. And so what the, Man the Manichaeans argued is that because your mind keeps reverting back to sensory images when you think about things like spirit, that proves that the idea of spirit is nonsensical because the mind is trying to reject it by going back to physical realities. Well, what St. Augustine will discover here, primarily through the writings of the Neoplatonists, people like Plotinus, that we've talked about in another presentation, uh, what Augustine will discover by reading the, the writings of the Platonists, as he, he calls them in the, in the Confessions, uh, is that there is a whole category of things that we think about and talk about as human beings that we cannot uh, equate with a sensory image. Uh, for example, we could use, uh, we could use love, uh, and we could use a geometrical object like triangularity or circularity. If we think about triangularity, uh, there are many different possible triangles. Uh, if I ask you how big a triangle is, or how big a circle is, or how big a square is, your mind kind of uh, repulses at that because you can think about many different sizes. It doesn't have to be one size. It could be an infinity of different sizes uh, that fall under the category of triangularity. So you cannot have, here's the important point, you cannot have a mental picture of triangularity that encompasses everything that is meant by triangularity. Uh, and that point stuck with Augustine, that we think meaningfully about things that cannot be reduced to a single mental picture. Uh, take also love. If I ask you what is love, you probably will turn to experiences of love, like the care that a parent has for a child, or perhaps you'll see a picture of a heart, or maybe a, a boy holding his dog, or a mother holding her child, or whatever. And you might use that as a, a picture of love. But none of those things capture all that love is. Love is something that, that defies uh, conceptualization or picturing, but it doesn't mean that it is meaningless. And so Augustine sees this, that, that there are things that are truly meaningful that our concepts, ideas, or mental pictures cannot exhaust. Uh, and therefore he rejects the Manichaean rejection of spirit and embraces the possibility, in fact the, the actuality, of things that are not reducible to human sensory experience.